we have been talking about raising our voice and what, uh, and what that means. We've been exploring together for the last two Sundays. We use the story of Esther to remind us that before we can raise our voice, we must first find our voice. And last week we said that our voice is more than our vocal cords, that our voice comes from our identity as human beings created in the image of God. And it is as much as what we do as it is what we say. That is our voice. And today our gathering is on the Sunday before an election day. Voting is an important way to raise our voice. And this was part of the plan as we planned worship back in July and August that we would conclude with a series, Raise Your Voice, on the Sunday before Election Day. So go, vote, and raise your voice. Voting is really an easy way to raise your voice. And there are many other times and circumstances when and how to raise your voice is much more difficult to discern. But I think there is a guideline to help us discern when to raise our voice, how to raise our voice, or maybe even when not to raise our voice. And I want to try and convey this to you with a couple of stories. Peg reminded me that this week, last year, Tim Schmaltz and I went to Washington, D.C. to advocate for Dreamers and for Sixto Paz. We went to the seat of our country's political power to raise our voice. As a result, I spent a few hours in a Washington, D.C. jail. And since that time, I have a get-out-of-jail-free card on my office door. <laughs> Thank you for that, Joe? I think, you, Joe, didn't you put it there? Or, or was it Bill? Yeah, all right. Sometimes I get things put on my door and they're not signed. <laughs> as important as that word and work was, it was not the most significant raise your voice moment for me. While I sat in the back of a paddy wagon, and by the way, the reason why it's called a paddy wagon is because uh, it got that nickname uh, because a high number of, of uh, Irishmen became police officers. Thus, when they rounded people up and put them in the back of this wagon, it became a paddy wagon. When I was in back of the paddy wagon, I was the first one arrested and got to sit way, way inside the vehicle. I heard a black preacher tell the story of being a young man in Kansas City over 40 years ago and being abused by the police. The abuse included a beating and an officer sticking a revolver in his mouth. He was released with no charges and said he thought that he had dealt with it. About six months after the incident, he was pulled over by a police officer and told to get out of the car. He got out of the car, but he couldn't speak or answer the officer's questions. He couldn't even say his own name because he was so traumatized and afraid. After we were processed, about eight of us sat in a small holding cell, and one by one were called, processed one more time, and released. It got down to the two of us. It occurred to me that if the police called me before him, he would be in the cell by himself with his memories. I told him that if the police came and called me before him, I would offer to stay so he could be processed and not be by himself. He thanked me for that, and he said when he told his story, he wasn't even sure anyone was listening. As it turned out, I did not have to raise my voice. He was called before me, and I was processed last. I was the first to be arrested and the last to be processed, 
it gives a whole new meaning to Jesus' words, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. <laughs> I think that it was love that allowed me to hear him. And it was love that put me on the edge of raising my voice. Another story. I received a call last Thursday from a journalist who wanted to do a story about church and security. This journalist knew we were struggling with some security challenges around our providing hospitality to asylum seekers and concerns from some preschool parents. The journalist was also wanting to follow up with the terrorist event at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh. I thought about this and my first thought was that terrorists go after soft targets. And this story would send the message that we were taking security measures and therefore we were not a soft target. It would be a story to provide some preventative measure. My second thought was that the preschool parents who feel their children are vulnerable because Shadow Rock was in the news again would be upset despite the strong security message of the story. Also, I thought that our church and preschool leadership is emotionally strained and drained on this issue. I decided to consult with Liz and Magda, our preschool director, and lay out the options, and they took a deep breath and were relieved that Shadow Rock was not going to be in the news again. I thought at this time it was better for us not to raise our voice, and again, it feels like the most loving thing to do. This last August, one more story. Peg and I attended her nephew's wedding in Minnesota. It was a great celebration of all of Peg's, of, of love and all of Peg's family was there. Peg and I and her brothers and their wives were gathered at the same table. Somehow, the conversation turned to Colin Kaepernick, an NFL player taking a knee during the national anthem. One of Peg's brothers said very strongly how inappropriate he thinks it is that an entertainment sports event is turned into a political statement. I had to raise my voice. In June, I had attended an event about the legacy of slavery that missionary societies contributed to. You see, missionaries would sail from Europe to Africa. The same ships would then be loaded with Africans to be sold into slavery and sailed to the Americas. And then the emptied slave ships would be loaded with goods from the Americas and brought to Europe. And then the cycle would start all over again. While at this conference in Alabama, we visited the lynching memorial, the terror, the violence, the inhumanity, and the sheer numbers was overwhelming. My role was to be a listener and observer of the discussions. At one table, I heard a white man say, quote, I am ashamed that this was part of my history, unquote. A black woman responded by saying, Every time my son leaves the house, I'm afraid he won't come back. This violence may have been part of your history, but every day it is my reality. I will never forget what I witnessed and learned that day, so quietly and one-on-one -on -one while the dance music blared in celebration of love and marriage. I moved over to my brother-in-law's side and I told my brother-in-law that story, and that was why football players were taking knees during the national anthem. I had to raise my voice. And he said that he wishes that he and I could get to know each other better and spend more time with each other. When you hear the phrase, raise your voice, our thoughts might go to scenes of public protest and bullhorns. And that is one way to do it. 
When I think of the notion of raising our voice, I think we must hold each other accountable. That we do not raise our voice out of anger, but raise it out of love. I think we must hold each other accountable that we do not shut down our voice out of fear. We may choose the wisdom of Ecclesiastes and acknowledge that there is a time to speak and a time to be silent. But love, not fear, should always be our guide. I did hesitate to uh, share those stories with you because it seems to me it's kind of like I'm at the center of those stories and I, I don't like that part of it. But I share those stories not because I did it right. I share those stories because I struggle with it as I know that all of you must struggle with it. That when you hear the wrong thing, do you speak up or not speak up? No judgment about whether or not you speak up or not speak up. All I'm saying is, is that when we consider these things, let love be our guide. Amen.